Okay, this is review topic number nine, all about current and circuits. So I'll start out nice and easy with current. Okay, current has the equation I equals Q over T. Q is the charge and T is the time. It's essentially how much charge passes by a point in a given amount of time. It's more or less like the speed of the charges and they're moving. Um, and current is a coulomb per second, which is an amp. One ampere. Um, now, in terms of current, there's two things, two types of materials that relate to current. There's insulators and conductors. Now, insul oops, that's misspelled. Insulators um, do not allow electrons to flow through them very easily. Things like rubber and plastic, whatever. And conductors allow objects or electrons to flow through them easily. Things like metals or ionized gases. Okay. Um, remember Mrs. Howard always said, you know, metals are a sea of mobile electrons, which is why they make good conductors. Now if we look at the resistance in a conductor, okay, resistance is rho times the length over the area. This is for a given wire. Finding the resistance in that given wire. This right here is the resistivity. Okay. That's a property of the material that the wire is made up of. And the resistivity is given on your reference tables in a chart. And that's at 20 degrees Celsius. Now one of the things you have to be careful with with this resistivity and the chart that they give you is that all of them are at 20 degrees Celsius and all of them are like 2.82 times 10 to negative 8, or 1.72 times 10 to negative 8, except for nichrome. And a lot of times they like to use nichrome because instead of being like, you know, 1.59, it's actually 150 times 10 to the negative 8. Okay? So it, it's a slightly different in terms of, of, of decimal places there. Uh, so they do that to try to trick people. So be careful for nichrome. Um, the L, that's the length of the conducting wire. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. And then A is the cross-sectional area. Remember, cross-sectional area is pi r squared, if you have to figure it out. All right. So in terms of how these relate to the total resistance in the wire, resistivity goes up, resistance goes up. Length increases, resistance increases. Area decreases, resistance increases. So if you have, you know, a wire that's going to have the least resistance, it's going to be short and thick. Okay. A wire that would have more, the most resistance would be thin and longer. Okay. So this would be the least, this would be the most. Now, if we start taking a look at circuits, and, and you know, and how current and circuits relate to each other. We look at Ohm's law. And Ohm's law simply relates the resistance to the voltage and the current. Okay. Where voltage is the amount of energy to push the electrons. Okay. And current is really just kind of more or less the how fast those charges are moving. And it's only electrons that are moving, not protons, of course. Um, and this equation allows us to figure out lots of things when it comes into circuits. Okay. So a basic circuit has to consist of a power source. Could be a battery, could be an outlet, whatever it may be. It has to have a path of conducting material, and it has to have an energy user. Okay. It could be a resistor. If we do that, it becomes a light bulb, whatever it may be. But in order to have a, a, a complete circuit, you have to have all three things, a power source, an energy user, and a path for the electrons to travel. Missing any one of those things, and our basic circuit is no longer existent. If we don't have an energy user, and this is just a straight line that connects there. That's a short circuit, 
and that means that all that energy that is the moving electrons turns into heat, and that can be pretty dangerous. Now, the, the slightly more difficult part here is where we get into the two different types of circuits. Okay? A series circuit is the first type, and what I would arguably say the simplest type. Um, it involves a power source. Okay? You have the path, and then you have multiple energy users all in the same path. So if those electrons are traveling down through here, they have to go through every one of those energy users to get back to the other side of the battery. Um, now in a series circuit, because current only changes when it breaks off into a new path, current stays the same. So the total current is equal to the current in the first resistor, equal to the current in the second resistor, equal to the current in the third resistor, so forth and so on. The potential difference, total potential difference, or voltage drop, is equal to the sum of all the voltage drops. So if we know that this is a, let's call this a 5 ohm resistor, let's call this one a 10 ohm resistor, and let's call this a 20 ohm resistor, okay? And let's say that our power source is, uh, let's go with, Let's just say 5 volts. It'll be nice and easy. Okay. So, if we know that this is 5 volts and we know the resistance is here, we can find the total current. Okay. Total current, using Ohm's law, R equals V over I. Total current would just be equal, if we rearrange that, to total voltage over total resistance. Total voltage is the 5 volts. Total resistance is just simply adding all the resistors up. So REQ, we call that the equivalent resistance, that's the total resistance of the circuit, is R1 plus R2 plus R3. Okay. So in this case it would be 5 plus 10 plus 20, that's 35 ohms. So our current comes out to be 1 7th of an amp. Okay. Or in decimals, um, calculator, is 0.143, okay. just call that 0.14 amps. So now we know that each one of these has 0.14 amps going through it because the current never changes. So we can find out the potential difference in each one of these resistors simply by doing R equals V over I for each one of these. Okay, So for this one, we would just use this resistance, we would use this current, and find the voltage. We do the same thing over for this one, R equals V over I. We use this resistance, this current, and solve for the voltage. We do the same thing for the third one. Now when we get our, our voltages, our answers, the total voltage, if we add up the total voltage drop, potential difference drop, across each one of those resistors, should come out to be 5, if you did it correctly. Okay. So now, if we... Let's draw another series circuit here. It's the basic one. We'll have two resistors on this one. And we're going to take a look at where we can put ammeters and, and voltmeters. Ammeters are given by that symbol. And that measures the current. So since the current stays constant in a series circuit, we can put it anywhere. We can put it here, that's fine. We can put it over here, that's fine. We can put it over here, that's fine. It's going to read the same thing no matter where we put it. Now the voltmeter, which is a V, so that's our voltmeter. And that measures the potential difference drop across each resistor. So if we wanted the whole voltage, we would have to go across power source. Okay? And we always hook up ammeters in series right in line. Voltmeters have to be hooked up in parallel. They have to have their own path. 
This voltmeter would go right here. That would measure the potential difference drop across just this resistor. You could hook one up over here, and that would be for just this resistor. Okay, they have to have their own path, and whatever they're going around, that's the voltage that they measure. Now in a parallel circuit, oops. Ah, I can't write today. There we go. Things are a little bit different. Okay. So in this case, we've got, again, our path. But now each resistor has its own path. Okay. In a series circuit, if something happens to one of these elements, then the whole thing shuts down. The whole circuit is done. In this one, if something happens to this element here, that one, something happens to that, the rest of them still stay functioning because they have their own path to get the electrons to them. Now, in a parallel circuit, potential difference is constant. So let's say we have a 10 volt battery. Every single one of these is going to have a 10 volt potential difference drop. That's not going to change. Okay, that stays the same. Current is the one thing that's going to change. Total current is equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3. So as soon as there's a branch, so you have the current coming this way, some of it's going to go this way, some of it's going to go that way. So, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but the current is the one thing that's going to change. So you can solve for the current in each one of these, add them up, and you can get the total current. If we know these resistances, let's say that this is 2 ohms. If we make this 4 ohms, and let's make this one 6 ohms. Okay, So we could use R equals V over I. For each of those instances where we know that each one is 10 volts, we know their resistance, we can solve for their current. And then the total current should add up to the total current in the circuit. Now, one thing that's different about parallel is the equivalent resistance. This is the one that's tricky. To find the equivalent resistance, it's 1 over the equivalent resistance equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. So in this case, it would be 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 6. Okay. So if you do, you know, least common denominator type of thing, um, it becomes 6 over 12 plus 3 over 12 plus 2 over 12, which comes out to be, what is that, 11 over 12? Okay. So, but that's not your equivalent resistance. It's the inverse of that, because 1 over the equivalent resistance equals 11 over 12. You take the inverse, 12 over 11 ohms would be our equivalent resistance. And one of the things about parallel compared to series is that the total equivalent resistance in parallel is always less than the smallest resistor. So if we add more resistors in parallel, our equivalent total resistance decreases. In series, it increases, but in parallel, it decreases. Okay. Um, and the last thing, Kirchhoff's law for current. Okay. If we have a junction, so we have, let's say we have six amps coming in to this junction. And then it branches off this way and this way. And we know we have two amps going this direction. Okay, The current in to a junction has to equal the current out. So if we have six amps going in, we have two amps going that way, that means we have four amps going this direction. They always ask a question about that. Sometimes it's you know a four-way junction where you have, let's say, seven amps going in, and you have one amp going this way. Let's say you have two amps going... Now let's make that mm, 8 amps going in this way. And they'll ask you, you know, the magnitude and the direction of the current coming from on this last part. Let's call that part A. And actually, let's call that part B so we don't get it confused with amps. Okay? So we have 7 amps going in, and we have 9 leaving. That means we have to have an additional 2 amps going into the junction. So we have a total of 9 going in and a total of 9 going out. Okay. Any questions? Just see me.